Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a Thursday morning. We're talking about uh, uh, we're talking about history lens. We're talking about history of the United States. Uh, the title of our show is "Fixing the Constitution to Resolve Our Competing Narratives." That's complicated. Um, my brother joins us from Yale, Gene Fidel. He teaches there. David Louie, former Attorney General of the State of Hawaii, joins us from Honolulu. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi. Aloha. So, I want to start this by, um, you know, reading out of um, an essay, Gene, that you sent me. Uh, Before you I do, thought... Jay, uh, let, let me mention I'm teaching now at NYU, your alma okay. mater. Okay, yeah, alma mater. That's a step up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not enough simply to get Trump out, undo what he has done, and make some reforms. Um, like, who came up with Build Back Better? We should recognize, um, thanks to COVID and Trump, that our government has become dysfunctional and that our national narrative, which one, there are several, and New York Times had a, a project on that, is, is spent. Um, <clears throat> what is our national narrative? We are entering a third chapter into the American story, a fourth, if you consider 1619 to 70, 1776 as a a, a colonial period with its own narratives, fashioned by Puritans and the Board of Trade in London. And, and we need a significantly new narrative that takes account of not only our, uh, not only our in important respects, nasty history, but also our changed demographics and heightened expectations of social justice. Okay, let's stop there. There's more to the narrative. But I want to get um, your thoughts about, uh, you know, A, what periods we've been through, whether we're in the third or the fourth uh, chapter now, um, and what, and, um, you know, how American history has, uh, looking back uh, on the United States, how it has evolved, uh, where are we in terms of the American narrative? Gene, you start, you wrote the essay. Right. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the point about the narrative is, the narrative is the uh, organizing myth, and you know, myth doesn't mean it's just a fairy tale, but you know, it's what people buy into and feel deeply. Uh, the organizing myth around which society forms and that uh, breathes life into what would otherwise be a, a mere collection of individuals. So, uh, step one, I think, is to try to identify the epochs. Uh, in the country's life. And uh, every step of what I'm about to say is contested territory. And David Louie can uh, help me on this, but I'll, I'll just give you the very short version. The first epoch is, I can't give you the beginning date for the first epoch. I can give you the end date. The end date is July 4th, 1776. The beginning date is itself a function of what your narrative is, because for uh, black people in America, uh, the beginning date is 1619. For other people, it's 1492. For other people, namely the original inhabitants, it's you know creation. Uh, uh, for people in Hawaii, it's you know what, whatever what, whatever it is when society coalesced in what we call the Sandwich Islands, right? Uh, so uh, you know that's that's. Step one, uh, phase one, and and, and of course, uh, you know you would you would uh, identify different epochs since you all are in Honolulu. Uh, I, I want to respect that and and the notion that the epochs are somewhat different for people in Hawaii. Uh, the epochs may run to uh, uh, the uh, consolidation of power by Kamehameha uh, the first, or they may run. Uh, from, uh, to the great Mahele, uh, correct my pronunciation, they may run to uh, um, the uh, uh, um, end of the monarchy, uh, and, and uh, they may run to the end of to statehood and so forth. So, you know, that's a somewhat different uh, slicing of, of time. But for uh, the United States as a political entity, uh, as I say, Epic number one uh, uh, notionally ends on July 4th, 76. Uh, epic number two 
I would say ends at Appomattox Courthouse. Epic number three uh, is ending now. And the question is, what, what will be the nature and character of epic number four? So that, that's, that's sort of setting the stage. Now, oh, just a word about narratives. Uh, the, the fact is that you can have more than one narrative operating at any given time. Uh, so that, for example, you could have the narrative of the melting pot, <laughs> right? You could have the narrative of liberation. You could have the narrative of um, America first. You could have the narrative of, uh, 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 you know, universal suffrage uh, and, and so forth. And these themes uh, do not begin and end at the, at the same instant. Uh, some may be peaking at a time when other narratives, competing narratives may be, you know, uh, reaching the bottom. And by the way, Native Americans have a whole other narrative, uh, which we shouldn't, uh, uh, neglect and uh, Native Hawaiians ditto, uh, Native Alaskans yet another narrative. Uh, so it's a very complicated process that doesn't lend itself to mathematical certainty. But I think most people who are willing to uh, look at uh, uh, the long run of uh, the American state uh, can I identify uh, both the function of narrative you know, keep the foreigners out, bring the foreigners in, uh, give me a tired your poor, build a wall. <laughs> but right now, Gene, isn't, isn't it all focused on, on just two narratives? One is the people who are attracted to Trump and the other people who are not attracted to Trump. Um, and that's what's, that's what's coming up here on November 3rd, isn't it? And no, we, no, we, we it collectively are gonna have to make a decision about which narrative to take. Oh, oh, sure. Well, no, but I don't, I don't think uh, uh, President Trump, I don't think there is a Trumpian narrative. I think Trump uh, uh, exemplifies uh, some themes that we've seen over American history. I mean, if, if the Know Nothing Party still existed, it went out of business, I think, in the 18, late 1840s, early 1850s, uh, you know, he'd be a Know Nothing president. You know, I, I mean, with initial caps, no, nothing party president. Uh, so uh, there's, there's nothing particularly new there. Uh, the notion that there's a, um, uh, what is it? The paranoid strain in American politics is a famous essay. Uh, you know, that's been there for a long time. Uh, so he, he's not novel, except to the extent that we now have a combination and it's a very toxic combination. I'm almost finished, David. Uh, uh, He's I almost need, finished, David. I need, to, I need to hear from David. But but we now have a toxic combination of that narrative uh, with a, uh, a, a lunatic as its uh, representative. Sounds you know? to me like this is a combination of complex and simple. What do you think, David? So, you know, I totally agree that there's a narrative going on uh, right now, uh, and that it is important for the country, for the nation, to have a narrative. Um, I, I like to, it, quite frankly, I, I, Trump's narrative, make America great, or uh, let's go back to the good old days when whites were supreme and everybody else knew their place, uh, including women and minorities and people of color. You know, that, that, that doesn't do it for me. But, but currently, the Dems narrative is uh, uh, we don't want Trump. And that's not good enough for me, okay? Because that's just being anti-Trump is, is not a good narrative. I think the narrative ought to be, and I, I quite frankly, I don't like uh, Build Back Better. Um, it, it, that came from a 2015 UN disaster recovery conference in Sendai, Japan, uh, where they came up with that slogan. Um, and yes, we are talking about getting rid of Trump and that is disaster recovery, but it's not really a good slogan to me. I, I think the slogan really is or should be um, the better angels or what Bill Bradley said that President Lincoln said, which was, can't, can't we all do better? Um, 
and 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 really it's it's to me that the the narrative that I think has resonated throughout American history, um, sometimes more, sometimes less, is let's all achieve and let's all do something good for everybody. Uh, the greatest good for the greatest number, which is sort of the underlying foundation of, of good government in my mind. So I think that's the, the narrative that should be pushed. Whether or not we're going to get there, I don't know. Narratives are, you know, simplifications. I agree with Gene. They are myths. They are rallying cries so that you can simplify things and appeal to the base instincts of people so as to engender action. Um, you know, it's it, it comes back to ethos, pathos, and logos, and it's pathos, which is um, let's let's get right to the emotional resonance of something so that people will not think critically about what's going on. And so that's what narratives are, uh, but they do have a useful place. And, and so I hope we can come up with uh, a new narrative for the American dream. Well, I hope you'll agree with me. We're at an inflection uh, I, I point, wanna, and we have com say, competing uh, narratives now that are more troublesome, uh, and and are in need of resolution. Let me let me read Gene the uh, the third paragraph of the essay. <clears throat> we need to really work on the racism piece, on policing, on limitless military spending, and foreign adventurism. Equal suffrage of the states in the Senate and the Second Amendment are our enemies now. The latter can be fixed to some extent by changes for the better on the Supreme Court. But the former is well and truly baked in and therefore requires a new constitution. I'm sorry to say, and this is really an important part of our discussion, that I would predict civil disorder. So, so tell me, how do the narratives uh, you know, raise their heads now uh, and require us to consider amendments uh, that, that could be sweeping, Gene? Well, uh, let's, let's start with the equal suffrage um, of the states and the Senate. Uh, and a, a word of history here uh, that you gentlemen both uh, know very well. There were two things in the 1787 Constitution that uh, were outside the amending power. Right there, there's the, the key element of the Constitution is how you change it. Uh, and the two things were, number one, uh, Congress could not tinker with the slave trade. They didn't use the word slave trade, but that was one. And that provision was untouchable until 1808. The other provision was that uh, the equal suffrage of the states in the Senate could not be tinkered with ever. That is, that is there. And as long as we're under the 1787 constitution, uh, we have to live with that. Now, are, are there workarounds for that? Yes, there are. Uh, for example, I spoke to a uh, gifted friend the other day about this and he said, well, uh, California could uh, be split into several states. <laughs> Uh, and, th and the problem, and then you wouldn't, I'm, not, I'm now going to pick on a state with a small population. It is very difficult to explain to a person from California why Idaho has whatever it is, three or four votes, you know, three or four votes in the uh, electoral college. Uh, and remember that uh, I think four of the last five uh, presidential elections have gone to people other than the, uh, am I right on this? Uh, the, the, that there have been repeated instances in which the winner was not the winner of the popular vote. Mr. Trump being the most recent example of this, but it's happened before. Um, and with some regularity in the late uh, 20th and early 21st century. So uh, there is a problem, uh, it, it, it particularly, and here I'll, I'm gonna play lawyer for a second. Uh, since the 14th Amendment, uh, we've had equal protection of the laws. Uh, since the 60s, we've had one person, one vote. It was originally one man, one vote, but you know now it's one person, one vote. Um, so there's a notion of equality that everybody should have roughly the same say 
in the operation of this polity and the uh, equal suffrage of the states in the Senate is wildly inconsistent with the notion of equality, which talk about a narrative, the notion of equality since the 14th Amendment was ratified. So you've got this, it's, it's like a, uh, an orchestra where everybody's playing Mozart, but there's one guy beating on a garbage can over there and you can't make him shut up because he's baked into the, 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 uh, the music sheet. Uh, let, let me insinuate this provision, which is the very end of Article 5 of the Constitution. It says, in the Constitution, it says, when talking about amendments, it says, no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. So you would have to, you know, somehow turn that upside down in any amendment that would change the, you know, the, the arrangement in the Senate. Uh, not, no, no. Uh, what you would do is simply have to somehow negotiate the addition of, of states and by division. Now, you couldn't break up California without, I'm not picking on California, my daughter lives there, um, <laughs> but you, you couldn't uh, break up California without its consent, but there's no reason you can't break up a state. For example, Virginia was broken up during the Civil War, right? It's mm -hmm. true. There was one state and it became two states. So, you know, that can be done. Uh, that can be done in theory, uh, but, you know, how would you carry that out? I mean, it would really have to be, you'd have to have tremendous political leadership on a national level in order to bring that uh, over. Now, the one other thing, let me, just to, to uh, wrap this piece of it up, there's another thing that you could do, which is you could create two new states or a couple of new states without, uh, uh, you know, cutting up California. Uh, the District of Columbia could be made a state. Puerto Rico could be made a state. Puerto Rico has a larger population, I believe, than at least one or two or maybe three states. Uh, so there's a certain logic to that. Um, so there are things short of tossing the whole thing over, but those things are uh, long shots. And it's, it's not a surprise that the Republicans have basically resisted the creation of the District of Columbia as an additional, as a 51st state, because they're, uh, they're certain for some reason it would be a democratic jurisdiction. I don't know why they say where, that. Where would they get that idea? Yeah. So, so query, so, so if, it, if a state is created, both houses of Congress, it's legislation have to agree and it has to be signed or, or well, passed it, vetoed it be, by the president. It, it would, uh, let's see, uh, I don't think that you would need a constitutional amendment. No, but the standard would be less than a constitutional amendment. David, what do you think about all this? Is, is there a solution on this uh, senatorial problem? Was, was the, well, I, I do appreciate the structural problems, the Electoral College, the Senate, the, all of those things. To me, um, the, the structural problems that exist in the country are kind of baked in. And while it would be nice to try and change those, it is an unbelievably heavy lift to change any of that structure. And so I believe that, that the efforts are better spent in actual direct initiatives towards social justice initiatives, such as Black Lives Matter, such as reforming police unions, such as uh, balancing the budget, such as stopping wars, such as giving you know, uh, equal, equal rights to women and, and getting an equal rights amendment. So I would advocate for spending the time doing that because I think when you go into trying to change the structure Although it becomes a proxy, it is a proxy for whether we're going to have progressive change or not, you can get too caught up in the structure. And then you don't really get to the problem, which is to me, so I, I mean, I'd rather address the problem. Yeah, you know, it's hard to change the structure, Gene, but does David's approach go far enough to get where we need to go? Well, David's a realist and he's lived in the, uh, the, uh, cockpit of uh, political life uh, in ways that I haven't. Uh, and, um, and so, you, you know, feel free to discount what, I, what I'm saying. Uh, I, I also think that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think, uh, you know, the, the, uh, David's approach is, uh, 
a, a disworldly approach and mine is the world to come in a way. <laughs> uh, but that, that said, uh, uh, I, I think that there are things that uh, really uh, uh, are very concerning. And uh, I don't think we can assume that uh, it's going to be business as usual in this country in the, uh, the final days of this administration, as, as this era comes to a, an abrupt and really messy end. I believe that this era is going to end in civil disorder. Uh, I'm not happy to say that, but I believe that's the case. I think for, in large measure, we have President Trump personally to thank for this. Uh, he has spent years invoking the Second Amendment as if it was a battle cry. Uh, he has um, done nothing to uh, uh, foster uh, intelligent gun control. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, in the case of Heller against District of Columbia, uh, got the Second Amendment so bollocked up that uh, we're now at the mercy of anybody who can uh, find someone who will sell him or her an automatic weapon. Uh, and uh, Trump has basically uh, thrown a match into the gas tank. Uh, somebody referred to him as an arsonist, a political arsonist, and I think that's absolutely the case. And um, the, uh, the gas tank that's been sitting around, it's like Justice, uh, uh, who was it, uh, who referred to uh, uh, leaving a loaded gun around, Justice Jackson referred to leaving a loaded gun around. Uh, uh, the, the Second Amendment has been a loaded gun, no pun intended, uh, a political loaded gun. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it's there uh, for any, uh, uh, anybody uh, to take. And people can wrap themselves in the Second Amendment and claim to be a truthful, uh, you know, faithful adherents of the U.S. Constitution. It's, it's a totally crazy. Uh, now, that can be overcome uh, through uh, either the Grim Reaper uh, dealing with the Supreme Court and, uh, you know, the, the proper uh, sensible justices being named who will overturn Heller against the District of Columbia. Uh, or uh, it's not written anywhere, aside from an act of Congress, that there can only be nine justices on the Supreme Court. Now, court packing uh, is a dirty word in American uh, politics. Uh, FDR tried it and uh, it, it cratered and it was a kind of black eye. But, um, you know, would you be, would a president uh, who had really uh, a, a great head of steam and was an effective leader and uh, uh, if the country was appalled by the amount of gun violence uh, everywhere, uh, be able to overcome that and say, well, we're, we're going to name five more justices, and we're going to overturn Heller. Um, and maybe that's the way around that, simply let it work out through time. But in the meantime, I, I have to say that thanks to uh, the president and his enablers, um, the transition to the next administration, uh, touch wood, uh, uh, headed by uh, Vice President Biden and Senator Harris, uh, you know, is, is not going to be a friendly one. Now, it, it, there's friendly and friendly. I, I remember that wonderful New Yorker cover uh, about the transition from President Hoover to President Roosevelt, 1933. And they're in the limousine driving up to uh, Capitol Hill and uh, President Roosevelt sitting there with this you know, cigarette holder, very jaunty, and Hoover is sitting there in a top hat, very glum, uh, what, we're, what we're looking at for next January 20th is going to make that look like a tea party, you know, a love fest compared to the transition. Uh, you know, will President Trump even attend? Will he, will he be uh, hold, standing his ground saying the election was no good? Will Attorney General Barr be uh, continuing to lead the Department of Justice and, uh, you know, create uh, so much uncertainty and tie things up uh, uh, on, on their way to the Supreme Court, and we may not know for quite a while, even after uh, January 20th. Happily, the Constitution and the laws seem to deal with every contingency, but the 
<laughs> that may be famous last words. There's always the next con the, the contingency no one thought of. Well, you did. But, but, I, but I see, wow. but I see here a, uh, a a genuine prospect for uh, a, a, for civil disorder. And when the president of the United States talks about invoking the Insurrection Act and putting putting fa making fast work of uh, demonstrators and protesters. Uh, in an environment where everybody's armed to the teeth, uh, I, uh, I I'm I'm not happy to say this, but I have to say it's at least as likely as not that there's going to be a real uh, a crisis. Yeah, David, do you share the concern? Uh, I share the concern that there will be civil disorder. I think it will be damped down. I think the military will and the police authorities, such as they are. Uh, will maintain order. Uh, there will be demonstrations. There may even be riots, uh, but I don't regard it as a crisis. I believe that there will still be a transition of power. Um, in order for Trump to do what he really in his heart of heart wants uh, to do, he would need the complicity of the military. I don't believe that the military uh, has changed over like uh, the Turkish military has changed over to empower Erdogan to just become a dictator. I don't believe that our military uh, agrees with that and, and will do that. So I, I think we will have a transition of power. It'll be bumpy. I see bumpy, but, but I think it'll happen. I, I think, you, I think you've been happen. spending your, your, I think your professional too, life around the military. You must have thoughts about how the military would, would present when, when this crisis takes place. Oh, I think the military will be uh, a, a model institution of American democracy. Uh, I think I think we'll all end up owing an, another kind of debt to people in uniform. Uh, it's interesting. It's not just national defense. It's they're defending the Constitution. I, I have every confidence. However, I also fear that we are going to have to rely on them as a sort of uh, uh, firewall. Well, it's hard to be optimistic about um, the resolution of all this and, and our lives after the fact. Um, but I, I wanted to just ask you guys one more question. So uh, walk and chew gum is, is, is something you said which interests me, Gene. Uh, and that is, um, can't, shouldn't we be considering constitutional amendments here? But how likely is it that we can pass one? If you look at, um, what is it, Article 5, it, it's not so easy. You have to have votes of two thirds or three quarters. It has to bounce back and forth between the states and the, and the Congress. Uh, we've had 27 amendments so far. How likely is it that we could pass an amendment that would reform you know, the, the problem in the Congress, the electoral vote uh, issue and the Second Amendment? How likely is it that we could do that? Well, it's not likely at all that uh, we could get an amendment that would fix the uh, the equal representation of the states. The other things that I talked about were workarounds, uh, you know, around that problem. The only way you can fix the equal uh, suffrage of the states uh, is actually by getting a new constitution, which would require uh, political violence. I, I, I don't mean people shooting at one another, but I mean, it would be an act of political violence and you'd, you'd at that point, enter the Second American Republic. Other countries have had multiple republics: the French Republic, the Fourth, Fifth Republic, uh, the Germans. You know, uh, so you know, uh, we might have to contemplate a Second American Republic. I would recommend that everybody who's concerned with with these issues read the book by uh, now the late Justice John Paul Stevens, where he identified uh, a number of amendments that he would make to the Constitution. Uh, it's a little book, but it's a book of great wisdom and people should be reading it. The other book they should read is Tim Snyder's book on tyranny. That's the more urgent task. Absolutely. David, you know, um, we had some experience with constitutional conventions in Hawaii. Uh, and one of the options in Article 5 is a constitutional convention. Um, in Hawaii, it has not been successful. Uh, what are your thoughts about whether, um, you know, whether it will ever be successful in Hawaii and why not? And uh, whether it could ever be successful nationally? Right. Well, so, so let's just take the national first. Um, three letters, D-O-A. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
did on arrival. Not going to happen because you need too much political agreement. We're, we're not anywhere close to that. So I don't, if you can't pass the Equal Rights Amendment, for God's sakes, um, the idea of reforming the Constitution and, and fixing things is, is not going to happen. So um, they're, they're, the, the, the trouble with changing the social compact, whether it is a marriage contract, whether it is a contract between business partners, is everybody anticipates whether they're going to win or lose with the new thing. Uh, and, you know, people don't want to be losers. Um, and, and the only way they become winners is if they can snooker the other guy or the other person on the other side so they don't realize that they're going to be losers. Um, as, as far as the Hawaii Constitution, uh, we had a, a, a con con uh, back in 1976, I believe, or 77, and, and a whole bunch of amendments passed um, establishing Native Hawaiian rights. Now, since that time, the Native Hawaiians, at least publicly in the press, have been reluctant to endorse another constitutional convention because they are afraid that there is backlash against that and that there will be a constitutional rollback of privileges and entitlements and things that, that they may have received um, through that con con. And so- That, that was the Native Hawaiians calling, David. Yes. <laughs> they, they, they didn't like what I said. I thought they were going to deal again. Um, but, but because there are always winners and losers and, and people anticipate whether they're going to win or lose, uh, none of these constitutional conventions happen in a vacuum. People are so attuned now to what might happen and the prospect of loss that I don't think anybody's going to agree to a constitutional convention, certainly not in Hawaii and certainly not in the United States. Well, given all of that, Gene, what do you what do you suggest that the individual citizen ought to be thinking about and doing, um, you know, to preserve the republic and to preserve, you know, the quality of life that he or she has enjoyed up to this point? Well, there are people who would say that uh, this republic needs a fresh start. You know, people who have uh, studied it closely and trace America the 1619 narrative, the narrative, the, the narrative that suggests that the American state, you know, has slavery in its bones. You know, that, that, that's a serious issue that the country has to address. Uh, but I, I, wanna, I wanna sort of uh, wrap up, if I can, on, on a, a positive note. Um, the, the first thing is, I think, and in response to your question, Jay, everybody should vote. Once, when he, when he, uh, <laughs> once. Uh, I, I don't do criminal work, uh, <laughs> but, but everybody should vote. There's no, there, there's no excuse for not voting. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is, um, I, I, by my rough calculation, the three of us, our ages would be somewhere north of 200 years. Uh, there's a new generation that is arising, that has arisen. Uh, people like AOC, uh, who actually represents part of Queens County where Jay and I grew up, uh, and, and other young people who are entering politics, uh, who are, for whom social justice is a major issue and inequality is a major issue, a driving force. And I'm encouraged by that. They're gonna inherit whatever wreckage exists as we enter this next epoch of American national life. Uh, I wish them well. Uh, I, 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 you know, some of the stuff that they're going to want to do uh, is going to be unwise. It's going to be messy. Uh, it's, at times, it'll be ill thought through. Uh, but I think their willingness to take a fresh look at uh, pretty much everything and come up with a better narrative than uh, what, what is it uh, build back better? Uh, I, I, think, I think they're capable of doing it. I look to them, I'm excited by them. Uh, a AOC in particular gave some remarks on the floor of the House of Representatives when some member of Congress insulted her 
uh, on the Capitol grounds. It's just outrageous. Uh, I, I was blown away. And I think some of the other young people uh, who, uh, some people who have just been uh, successful in, uh, in the primaries uh, who are coming forward now, some of these people in the House of Representatives who were phenomenally impressive, phenomenally impressive people, many of them women, uh, many of them minorities, Native Americans. It's just tremendously exciting to me. And uh, I, I cheerfully pass the baton and wish them well. I got to reserve a little time for David. David, um, what are your thoughts about that? Do you have optimism and on what basis? Yeah, you know, I do have optimism. Um, my, my time in government, as brief as it was, I, I, I got a chance to see both Hawaii and the national scene. I, I met all these attorney generals, Republicans and Democrats. And, and, and although there were ideological clowns uh, sometimes, uh, for the most part, they were all highly professional, intelligent, pragmatic people. So I am optimistic about the bench of leaders that exists on both sides of the aisle and their ability, notwithstanding that our, our foray into Trumpism, that, that their ability to come together and, and work together to get pragmatic solutions. Now, in, in my view, people do need to vote and people need to be educated. I, I, I do share Gene's enthusiasm and optimism for young people, but I think it's also extremely important that we are doing a better job to educate uh, our young people about the importance of civic uh, engagement and civic issues. Uh, there is too much apathy. Uh, there is too much, I, I don't wanna be bothered. It's too complex. I don't wanna think about it. Uh, uh, kind of a mentality uh, that, that some young people have and, and hopefully better education uh, about why their vote matters uh, and why they need to be engaged uh, will bear dividends. Because to me, the, the, the hallmark of a functioning uh, real democracy is an educated electorate who can consider these things and on balance come to a good conclusion. Ah, a good conclusion. Thank you, David. David Louis, former Attorney General of the State of Hawaii and Gene Fidel. Um, a professor at NYU, was it, Gene? Thank you very much uh, for coming around, you guys. Thank you for this, this valuable discussion. Aloha. Thank you, Gene. Okay.